episode 40. Look, I'm a warfighter. I went to Iraq. Both my, both my um, founders went to Iraq. We fought bullets. I mean, we fought the enemy. We shot bullets downrange. We got shot at. And our number one goal as a company is to protect the country, protect the warfighter. And then, yeah, sure, we'll make some money doing that. But not our, our number one goal is not just to make money and not to do fear mongering when a new and your cybersecurity uh, uh, standard comes out. Welcome to the GovCon Giants podcast, federal contracting for people on the outside looking in. If you are here to learn how to win a piece of the pie without getting your face smashed in, then you've tuned in to the right place. Now, the giant that not only walks the walk, but talks the talk, your host, Eric Coffey. One of the hot button issues impacting contractors in 2020 is the new DLD Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification, also known as CMMC, which is expected to become a new standard starting sometime this year. We thought that since this issue is very unclear for most of us, that it would be a great topic to discuss entering the new year, particularly considering that the final standard is still not yet solidified and the penalties for noncompliance have not been enacted as of the time of this recording. Today, we're having a conversation with Jonathan Hard, who frequently speaks on the topic of covered defense information and compliance with DFARS 252.204.702 clause, which is the Safeguarding Covered Defense Information and Cyber Incident Reporting. Jonathan is the CEO and president of H2L Solutions, Inc., also known as H2L. H2L specializes in cyber and information assurance, and provides cybersecurity solutions for government and commercial customers. Jonathan has presented at various regional conferences on the subject, including InfraGuard, ISACA, ASIS, NCMA, NCMS, just to name a few. Prior to founding H2L, Jonathan served as a cybersecurity engineer in the defense industry. He was also in the Alabama National Guard for 12 years. During that time, he graduated from Infantry Officer Basic Course, Ranger School, Airborne School, and completed a tour in Iraq as an infantry officer. We'd like to welcome our next giant, Jonathan Hart. Welcome, Jonathan. Hey, thank you so much. Uh, I'm really, really honored to be uh, interviewed today. Hey, not a problem. So tell us, uh, when did you found the company? So founded the company April 15th of 2014. Okay. Um, and if you wouldn't mind telling us a little bit about your entrepreneurial journey, how did you get there? Yeah, sure. So I uh, came back from Iraq in 2007, 2008. Um, two of my uh, war buddies and I got into the GovCon sector. So we got hired by SAIC, worked for SAIC for about um, five years. Then I moved off to Mantec, which is another DOD contracting company, uh, Jacobs IT, and then IBM. And then uh, while we were at IBM, uh, doing information assurance, what is now called, you know, cybersecurity, doing uh, risk management framework accreditations for uh, the, the Department of Defense's information systems, we decided that we could do this ourselves. You know, we could have freedom um, to, with our own schedules. We could also um, do it more efficiently and um, less costly than the current companies that we were working for. So we decided to just start the company. Um, and when we started it, you know, we, we, so all three of us had never done anything like this before. We didn't have any work. We didn't have any contacts. We didn't have any connections. We didn't know how to run a company. Um, nothing. We literally said, Hey, let's start this, let's start a company and let's just do it. And, and, and we did it. And so, you know, some people are like, Oh, that's very entrepreneurial. Other people are like, you're, you're an idiot. Right. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, now, what's interesting, you said those were the same friends that you guys worked at SAIC and Jacobs together, Mantech. Did you just move from company to company together? So those two stayed at SAIC for about eight, nine years. I was the one who moved. So okay. I worked at SAIC for five years, and I went to those other three companies, and, and they stayed at uh, But you guys kept in contact. SAIC. You kept in contact. Oh, yeah, yeah. We were still in the same National Guard unit, drilled uh, every uh, one week in a month. Um, and, you know, main, maintained a uh, very close, close friendship. And of course we lived in the same town as well. So what really happened was in, um, uh, 2015, uh, they both came back from deployment 
and one of them didn't have a one of them did decided not to go back to SSC, so they that he didn't have a job, and um, we just decided to to start a company. Then he was he you know, his, his name was Jeffrey Hartsfield. He was the one who wanted to. He was like, why don't we do our own thing? And uh, you know, Stan Lozowski and myself never really thought about that. But then we were like, yeah, why don't we do our own thing? We can we can do this. We can do it, do this work. We can execute this work, and we can we can do it um, more efficiently and be in charge of our own destinies. One of the things that fascinates me is cybersecurity um, is still a new space. How do people learn? Like, how do you learn about doing cybersecurity? What do you learn that? Right. So, so I didn't know anything, Jack. You know, I didn't know Jack shit about cybersecurity until I came back from Iraq. I was an infantry officer um, in Iraq, uh, and when I came back, and it, well, and, and even before that, I worked for FedEx Express delivering packages, wearing those short shorts and everything. And so, <laughs> you know, yeah. You know, you know, got got deployed to Iraq, came back from Iraq, and the um, uh, a couple of managers at SSC picked me up, and they said, "All right, we're going to hire you as a systems engineer, and you're going to be an information assurance analyst." So I went home that night and I googled information assurance, and I'm like, "Oh, basically, it's just making sure that the systems that are on the Department of Defense networks are locked down and secured, and here's the processes and the policies that you have to learn in order to execute that." And so I'm like, "Yeah, Roger that. I can do that." You know, I just went. I was just you know fought in combat for a year for the country. I can definitely learn this. And so basically, um, they gave me a roadmap with uh, certain objectives to learn and put me in a training program and taught me about cybersecurity. All right. All right. So now you have a roadmap. You learn about cybersecurity. Um, one of your friends comes back and you guys decide, I'm going to you know, start a company. What, what happens next? Well, you know, there's a good, there's a good period from 2008 to, uh, you know, 2014 where we were continuing to learn. But once we decided to start the company, you know, we, we all kept our, our day job. Okay. So one, we made sure, yeah, we made sure there was no conflicts with our current employers, and, and we we told them, hey, we want to start a company, and they said, well, as long as it doesn't compete with our company, and you don't do any of your work while you know you're working for us, that's fine, because that that actually happens a lot within the DoD contracting space. People start companies all the time. Right. The the real question, <laughs> the real question is, are they going to make it or not? <laughs> you know, and so oh, that's sure. why people don't really care. You know, I, right. I have employees now that are saying, hey, sir, I want to start my own company. And I'm like, okay, I'll back you 100%. Let's do this. Right. You know, and I do right. wish them well, but most of the, most of the time they don't, they don't make it. Yeah, it's difficult. People don't understand. It's all involved in, in right. actually, you know, revenues, profits, books, finances, everything oh, that goes involved. It's right. horrible. Yeah. So, yeah. so like, so, so, so for your earlier question, we didn't know, we didn't know jack shit about running a company. We didn't know about insurance we didn't know about you know having your books uh, you know credited um all of that so what we did is we asked um we asked other leaders in town about you know their stories successful leaders mike mike uh, venturi at venturi aerospace and they said go to the small business offices go to the catalyst go to other company other non-for-profit organizations and learn from them and so that's what we did Okay. Okay. Nice. Nice. Uh, and that was when? What year? That was around 2014. That was 2014. Yeah. So, so 2014, we went to the small business office or the PTAC office at UAH. Talked to Mary Jane Fleming. Um, she told us three things: one, get a good lawyer, get a good accountant, and then get a good uh, banker. And so that's what we did. We 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 laid the solid foundation for the company from a um, back office support perspective before we started to do any work. Okay. Now, now how did you find the, the lawyer, the accountant, and the banker? So she gave us, she recommended um, different firms, and we went and then interviewed those. She had a list. And so a lot of these uh, banks and a lot of these, um, you know, lawyers and, and accountants will go and meet with organizations like this that help small businesses in order to be referred to new startup company. Mm, interesting. So now you have the lawyer, you have the accountant, you have the banker. What next? So we obviously wanted to get a line of credit because you know, all we had, we'd always heard that you need a line of credit um, in order to start a company. So we go to the bank that we picked 
And we said, we would like a line of credit and we would like a hundred thousand dollars. Now, in, now remember all three of us still had jobs and our collective um, income a year altogether was close to $300,000 a year, yeah. all three of us. Right. 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 And so the, the bank looked at us and, and they said, well, do you have any current work with your company? Um, and we said, no. And they're like, okay, well, here's a credit card and it has $2,500 on it. That's all we can give you. And we were like, what the fuck? <laughs> it's like yeah. holy shit. Yeah, right, um, right. Yeah. You know, and and so I mean I, I understand totally now where the bank comes from because the bank's not gonna give you a lot of credit unless you have something to execute that on. They're just not gonna give you three months. Yeah, right. No, I know. Yeah, no, no, good. I like it. I like it. Keep going. So you you can't get the line of credit, you get your credit five dollar credit credit card. How do you get your first client? So our first client came about I want to say four to six months after starting the company. Um, and really it came about through uh, capability briefs. So I knew that no one was going to do work with H2O solutions just because we started another DOD contracting company. So what I started to do was I, I, I made a profile on LinkedIn. I started searching uh, other local business owners in town, connecting with them on LinkedIn and then reaching out to them and uh, asking to do a capabilities brief. And so m m nine times out of 10, they said yes. So I'd go there to that uh, company, brief them on our capabilities. And we, we had nothing, you know, we did cybersecurity, but we had no past performance, which is another huge barrier to do work. Um, but this one particular business owner, um, the CEO and president of uh, Venturi Aerospace, Mike Alrez, called us three in and said, hey, guys, look, there's this new regulation out there called DFARS 252-204-7012, uh, and it's how to protect contractor or protect government's information, but on contractors' IT infrastructure. I want you guys to look at this, and I want you guys to do a crosswalk and an analysis, one, to make sure that I'm doing it right, and two, to develop a way to potentially do this for other companies. And so he called us in, I think, I think it was 20,000 bucks. And, um, you know, that was our first, that was our first gig that we did. Wow. Wow. Congratulations. Okay. Now you have, uh, now you do the assessment for him. Is that where your business is today? Is that what you guys primarily do or what's your primary focus? Right. So, so that we, we've done over 130 of those assessments today. So we have definitely really, um, that, that is one of our main areas. That being said, um, we also uh, do, I, would, I, would, I consider that commercial work because we're doing an assessment for another DOD contracting company. So it's not necessarily um, government work. But now we actually have broken into the government sector. So there's three main areas that we focus on, penetration testing, which is like, you know, red, red on blue, would, we would act as the red or the threat, the threat uh, cell attacking whatever it is that we want to attack, right? We do vulnerability assessments, which is friends on friends or blue on blue. And then we do compliance or governance regulations and compliance work. And that's where that DFAR 7012 risk management framework, 853, NIST 800-171, Sarbanes-Oxley, PCI, everything like that falls into that um division now and, we're, and we want to talk about that that's a great segment and because i received so much information regarding nist um, regarding cmmc and i mean i'm looking at these things and for the regular person it sounds foreign can you say it in a simple way like <laughs> that makes sense to us sure. lay people yeah yeah, so, so the CMMC program was derived out of the, D, the, the, the DFAR 7012 regulation. So it all started, it's a, and, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll, I'll spell all this out for you in one second. We'll give you a, a, a history lesson. So in, in 2010, Barack Obama signed an executive order that said NARA, which is National Archives and Records Association, he named them the executive agent in charge of creating a CUI program, controlled unclassified information. <clears throat> Until that point, 
any kind of unclassed information, it was markings were like wild, wild west. No one was really regulating it. And so President Obama said, we need to regulate this. NARA, you're going to be in charge of it. You're going to create a marking guideline. You're going to create a handbook. You're going to tell the Department of Defense what is CUI, what is controlled and classified information. Well, before NARA updated the FAR, the Federal Acquisition Requirement, the DOD, the Department of Defense, said, listen, our subcontractors and our contractors and our defense industrial base, the work that they are doing for the Department of Defense is very important and needs to be protected. So in 2013, they issued a DFAR ruling, a Defense Federal Acquisition Requirement Supplement, 252.204-7012, which basically said, if you and you being your, if you and you are a DOD contractor have any covered defense information on your networks and it's and it's transcending through or, or being stored on your networks, then you have to protect it with these security standards. Then those security standards morphed into the National Institute of Standards Public or NIST. National Institute of Standards Technology Special Publication 800-171 as, and it became the adequate security requirement. Now, that is 110 security controls that have to be implemented and um, integrated into your IT infrastructure. The way that the current 7012 ruling stated was that a company, say H2L Solutions, could take those 110 security controls implement them on their network and say and go and go back to the government said we did it so it's self basically you're self-certifying it was a horrible process it was a horrible process the the government was getting there was all of them looked different and so there was no there was no standardization as far as how that was working everyone knew that was going to fail so what they then created was the cmc program which is now a actual third-party certification they're collecting a group of different security standards and they're going to rank your company level one through five, five being the most highest secured um, uh, security controls implemented on your enterprise network from a DOD contractor perspective and level one being basic hygiene, right? And so the NIST AR-171 standard falls at level three. Okay, um, CMMC stands for Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification, by the way. Just Correct. I have it here for everyone to know. All right, um, and I have it. I have the, the model uh, revision point four, which shows level one, two, three, four, five. Um, level one is FAR 52, level three, NIST um, 800-171, revision one, and then this, then level four or five is the new, I guess, NIST. Right. Okay. Well, level four. Go ahead. Go ahead. Now, now, what does that? But again, what does that mean for us out there? What, what does that mean? What should? What do we have to do? So I, so I mean, I understand if, you said that so, you test our systems, but what does that mean? What does that look like? Right. So in September of 2020, there's going to be selected RFPs that are going in sections L and M are going to say if you. DOD contracting company want to go after whatever opportunity it is that 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 has um, has been chosen to put this um, level certification in there. If you want to go after this opportunity, we say with the air, we'll just say with the Air Force for hypersonics, right? Okay. Your company has to be certified at a level three CMMC, or you can't even bid on it. And now, so what you have to do start? is you when have to start? Get, Jonathan, when? So the September of 2020 okay. is, according to, to Miss Katie Arrington's office, when when those certain not every single RFP is going to have the in there, but certain RFPs okay. they're going to phase it in over a five year period. Okay. Okay. Now, um, okay, we have to be compliant, and it's going to tell us at which level one, two, three, four, five. Correct. Okay. It will say that in the RFP. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. For the solicitation. Okay. Fair enough. Now, um, now, what is that? So, what do I have to do? We have to we have to go out and find a cybersecurity company to then um, provide this third party certification for us. So, so there is an accreditation body that will be chosen by the government. The RFP has already went out. 
I don't know who they have chosen yet to be the accreditation body. So that accreditation body, once it's established, will then will then start training official third party audit companies, mm. certifying companies. And so if your company wants to be assessed, you will put a query into that accreditation body saying company XYZ, I need to be assessed at level three. They will come out and they will assess your company at, at, at with those level three security standards and see if you pass or not. They're not going to come in there and do it for you. So what you'd have to do is you'd have to download the security requirement standards, see where level three is, and see all the different controls, security controls that you would have to implement within your IT infrastructure in order to be a level three, a level four, a level five, and then put that request into that accreditation body for them to come have some of their certifier uh, teams out to actually do the certification or to do the assessment. Okay. All right. And that, that makes sense. It seems like that's the way that the government likes to do things. Uh, that's a similar way where they did the women owned so, small business certification. They went out and yeah, went out. correct. Yeah. 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 So it seems the way yep, that absolutely. seems to be their standard protocol for handling these types of things, which is great. Um, but again, I, let's assume I go out, uh, I, you know, I don't want to call them to assess me because I haven't done anything. How, what do I need to do on my end for my IT infrastructure to get it prepared for level three or four? So there's a couple of different, I can't go into all the details, okay. but this is a couple of different, well, there's a couple of different strategies. One, depending on how large your company is, you might already have IT staff, employed that can download the security requirements or security standards that would need to be implemented within your IT infrastructure. Okay. And that's probably the, the easiest route. Give your IT team, say, look, we want to be level three. Here are the IT security standards that are equivalent to level one, two, three, four, five. So you're going after level three, which um, kind of uh, correlates to NIST 800 171. So they'll download the NIST 800 171 and any other requirements um, that they, that Ms. Arrington's office has, has deemed that need to be implemented for a level three. They'll look at those. You they'll see, do a gap analysis. Real quick, so they'll Jonathan, look and you, see, you said Ms. Arrington's office. Who is, you keep referring to that office. What office is that? So she's out of the, out of the Pentagon. She's the one who's heading the whole CM, CMMC program. Okay. okay she's, right. she's pushing it. She's, she's going around the country talking about it and prepping um, the, defense industri the defense industrial base Okay. That this is coming. Okay. Yeah. All right. Fair enough. I'll look her up and see who who she is and where she's from. Okay. I'm sorry. Continue, please. No, that's fine. Um, and so they'll download those, that standard, and then they'll do a gap analysis based on those security controls and what other what what already IT infrastructure secure you have in place, and they'll say, well, here's the delta. So we need to we need to do multi-factor authentication. We need to do data data loss prevention. We need, we need to do mobile device um, or uh, mobile device security and, and things like that. And then they'll create whatever deficiencies they've found. They'll put those in a POEM, a plan of action, the milestones. And then internally, your company can start working to implement all those deficiencies. Once you've got that, all those security standards in place and you feel like you've, you know, done it correctly, then you call in uh, to that accreditation body. But you can also take it one step further. Okay. Before you call call in that uh, to the accreditation body, you can have a third party cybersecurity company come in and just double check everything to make sure you actually have done it correctly. That's that's the first way. The second way is you can totally outsource it to a cybersecurity company. They come in, they do all of that for you. They find your deficiencies, they find where you've implemented everything, and then they'll fix it for you too. And since they're not certifying you, there's no OCI issues. So they come in, they they find they do a whole gap analysis, they find the deltas, and then they fix the deltas, and they holistically make you compliant at whatever level you're looking at, and then you call the accreditation body and say we're ready for our certification. Okay. Now, is there a range in price of what that costs? They don't they don't know what it's going to cost, but I can tell you what it's cost from. Uh, from us doing the NIST Air 171 D4 7012 assistance, like I said, we've we've done over 130 some companies. It ranges on a couple a couple of factors. One, 
how complex is the current company that you're going to be that you're going to assess? If they if they're not if they're not an IT company or if they don't have a lot of IT infrastructure, it's going to cost them a lot more because they're going to have to buy firewalls. They're going to have to buy uh, multi-factor. They're going to have to buy data loss prevention. They're going to have to buy um, continuous monitoring. They're going to have to get a SIM. There's a ton of security um, technology that they're going to have to buy in order to be 100% compliant. That doesn't even cover the gap analysis or assessment piece. I would say anywhere, if you're a company of size of one to 100, just to do the gap analysis and then all of the policy development, because there's about 16 policies um, that you have to, cr- to have to create the system security plan, um, access control, incident response plan, and all that holistically is going to cost you probably around anywhere from ten to twenty five thousand, just depending on on how uh, what you need and what you don't have, and then the price just goes up from there. And that's just from an assessment and policy development perspective. That's not even talking about buying actually the IT security right, the you need. products that you're going to need. Yeah, right, yeah. Right. You know, this article that I have in front of me discuss exactly what you talked about right now, which is what is the cost to doing this? Um, and how is it possible to roll this out to, and not uh, impact small businesses? What do you, how, how is this even, how is this viable? For a so, one person so there's company. a couple what so there's a couple things that you can do. You can actually outsource as long as so so as long as your third party IT services provider or your third party managed security services provider, as long as they are compliant, you can outsource those controls to them. For instance, there's a company up north called Trusted Internet, right? They've devised this solution. It, they drop in a firewall. They drop in some other end nodes, and they will at a – and they've priced it for small businesses. I've seen the price structure. There's companies out there like this, and they've priced it economically where small businesses then can meet a lot of those uh, technical security controls by outsourcing this. And what they do is they monitor their, their a, a, a security operations center. They actually monitor your logs 24 seven, 24 seven will do that. And, and they, and they price it per, per user. Okay. Um, okay. And, and, and it's actually affordable. Okay. That doesn't cover your policy, policy and procedure uh, aspect. And that, you know, that's where a company like, you know, H2L or some other, there's a lot of companies that are popping up out of the woodwork now. Um, you know, and here's another, here's another pet peeve of mine, real pet peeve. When a security standard like this comes out, even when it came out, um, in, you know, in, 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 in 2013, when it came out in 2013, nobody gave a shit about it. Nobody was tracking it. No. Nobody cared. As soon, as soon as the missile defense agency here in Huntsville put it into their solicitation, everybody was like, what is this? That just so happened to be the time that we started to do a lot of public speaking about it. So everyone flocked to us. We've done probably more assessments than any other uh, company in the country when it comes to the NIST AR-171 and the DFAR-712 um, perspective. But now that the CMC thing's coming out, every little cybersecurity company in the woodwork is coming out saying, we have your solution, we can solve your problem. We've seen horror stories. We come in to companies who've already been assessed and they, they call us in because they just have a, they don't have a warm and fuzzy in their gut about what, what just, the process they just went through. It was one, a company in Florida. We went down there. They said, we paid $7,000 for someone to do a gap analysis for us. And I'm like, okay, cool. Let us look at it. We'll look at it and make sure. We'll just double check at a high level to make sure they did a good job. And then we'll help you to develop your policies and your procedures and do a you know, vulnerability scan and get you uh, hooked up with trusted internet to do their, all the continuous monitoring stuff. Literally, what they handed me was the NIST AHER 171 document, and beside each control was a check or an X. A check me, meant that that company had that control covered, and an X meant that they didn't. That's all they had. They paid $7,000 to this two-bit cybersecurity company that just really stole money from that company down in, down in Florida, 
and that's the level. They didn't do any proof of compliance. See, when a company, when a cybersecurity company goes in there um, and you're doing a gap analysis, you can't just say that a controller is compliant or not. You have to actually capture artifacts that proves that control is compliant because right. we, we're auditors as well. We go in there and we audit. Are you, do you have multi-factor authentication? Yes. Oh, great. Where's the policy? Also, where is it configured on your, your machines? I want to see both, and I need to take copies and screenshots of both so that we can prove that that control is compliant. So when the real people come, the real certifying authority comes down to, to you know, audit you, you can show that to them. So, I mean, that's just one of my pet peeves, though, is all these people popping up everywhere saying, beating their chests, we've got the, we've got the solution in this. We have the – they're just trying to make money. And that's right, what right. pisses me off more, more than anything. What pisses me off is companies just wanting to make money. Look, I'm a warfighter. I went to Iraq. Both my, both my um, founders went to Iraq. We fought bullets. I mean, we fought the enemy. We shot bullets downrange. We got shot at. And our number one goal as a company is to protect the country, protect the warfighter, and then, yeah, sure, we'll make some money doing that. But not our, our number one goal is not just to make money and not to do fear mongering when a new you know, cybersecurity uh, uh, standard comes out. And, you know, I'm, I'm happy you said that. I see that all the time, the fear mongering. That's where, I mean, it, it's coming – Everyone. That's why. That's why I said beginning the conversation that it's not a week that goes by where I don't see some fear mongering with regards to the cybersecurity requirements, and that's why we're happy to have you on here explaining some of that stuff. Now, with that said, how does it, does someone prevent themselves from being taken advantage of? What should they be looking for in terms of a company to to seek out uh, as for their cybersecurity needs? I'll tell you what, man. I was at the Society of American Military Engineers. S-A-M-E. And if you don't know about them, you need to look them up. You need to join them. They're, the, in my opinion, one of the best organizations in the country. I, I was at their small business. I was at their small business conference um, in Dallas uh, last week. And the topic was um, CMMC. And I, and I was going through it. And I had a gentleman on the front row standing up. And he, was, and he looked at me. He's like, he asked me a question. He's like, he was like, this shit. And he said that. He said, this shit is Greek to me. <laughs> He was like, I'm about to walk out. I'm, I'm done with people trying to tell me, you know, why I should take, I should, I should listen to this shit. And I said, listen, sir, please look, I'm just giving you a history lesson right now. I'm not even getting, getting in, I haven't even gotten into CMC yet. Please, please stay. I, I promise you, you'll learn more out of this session than any other session you've ever been to. He stayed. He immediately messaged me on LinkedIn. I found his booth. He's like, thank you so much. He was like, you're authentic. He was like, I feel like I can come to you and do business with you and trust every single word that comes out of your mouth because he's like, I've heard probably seven to eight presenters and they all were trying to get me to, to work with them and to use their company and they were all fear mongering. And he's like, you didn't fear monger. He's like, and he's like, you didn't even offer your company services. He's like, you, your presentation was only informa, informative and there was no fear mongering either. You were just stating the facts that this shit's here. You're going to have to be compliant in it. And this is how you got to do it. And so, you know, that, that's the message, man. That, that is, you know, if you're a small business, vet the hell out of any kind of cybersecurity company that you're thinking about bringing in to do this. But look for the ones that are authentic that, and look for the ones that aren't really, 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 really um, trying to get you to sign a contract with them. You know, we, we've actually lost money on doing these before. You know why? Because it's a small business and I care about that small business's success. That small business might be making something that's very, very important to our national defense. They might not have a lot of overhead to do this right. new cybersecurity compliance shit. Right, and so right. we'll go in and do it, do it, do it for them at cost or even lose a little to make sure that our country can still use that small business for whatever widget that they're making. Right. No, that's, that's amazing. That's great. We, um, no, we need people thinking like that way because again, um, I mean, 10 to 25,000, that's going to prohibit a lot of small business from doing this, which, um, I don't know how, how it's going to turn out at the end, if they're going to be going to lose contracts or lose opportunities, or they're going to be audited. I'm not sure. What are they saying is, is going to happen to people who are not complying? 
if you're not compliant, you don't do business with the government. You know, Mrs. Arrington's office said every single company, every single DOD contractor will have to be level one at a minimum. And level one's not too intensive. I think it's 17 controls that you have to apply. It's basic cybersecurity hygiene. Right. But at the same time, I, here's a problem. You know, I know we're getting run, we're getting close to them, but here's a problem that some companies are having. And we have a company that is a sub to, we'll just say, Austell. Okay, Austell, they make the littoral combat ships. What what level of CMC compliance is Austell going to have to be at? Are they going to have to be at a four or five? I mean, that's a that's a pretty freaking awesome ship. You don't want stuff to be. Um, leaked off of that from that from a design perspective at that at, from that that ship. Right. Well, they have thousands thousands of suppliers. Oh, well, yeah. we had one we had one uh, supplier in that supply chain that said they're telling me that I need to be CNC level uh, the, the four or five, which which was what Austin was going to have to be. All I do, Jonathan, all I do is buy commercial fuel and sell it to Austin. That's it. That's all I do. I don't get any design drawings. I don't get any specs. I get nothing. I buy commercial fuel and then deliver it to Austin. He's like, am I going to have to spend all of this money in order to continue to do that? He's like, I'll just stop selling um, fuel to Austin. Yeah. Well, you know, yeah. That, that's the problem where it gets into the, into the supply chain perspective. Right, because not every supplier is going to need to be at the same level that that prime is going to have to be, but the primes are are being held accountable for breaches um, and for their supply chain. Do, uh, uh, that's a good question. Do we have any data, or the, have you seen any data on the amount of breaches th- that's happening, or, or is this just something that we know is existing without having a, a number, or, or is it just not something that's been disclosed? Yeah, you know, there are, you know, that'd be something like the FBI or DOD Cyber Crime Center would have to, uh, you know, statistics on that. But they're they're every every single day, man. I mean, like when you have when our adversaries have battalions of people that all they do is twenty four seven go into this building and start hacking, it's going to happen. I mean, look at the, the look at the uh, certain companies. Spider looks exactly like like our F thirty five to the nice. team. You know, and so certain other technologies, you know, basically here, here's a warning to everyone who's, who's doing hypersonic. If you're doing hypersonics right now, hypersonic missiles for the U.S. government, you are a high target to be breached, hacked, infiltrated. So if you're doing hypersonics, please get the best cybersecurity out there possible. The only way, in my opinion, for you not to be hacked or breached is to do a, is to create a standalone system. And, and make sure that and put a freaking guard in front of it and make sure that no one <laughs> puts a thumb drive or a CD in that mother effort because, uh. because that's true. And that's what, you know, there was a rumor a couple couple years back that the Kremlin took all their computers out and went back to, to hand to typewriters, doing typewriter typewriting memos wow. again. Wow. Because they did not they they don't you know, they don't want stuff like that to be uh, to, to be hacked. We do it too as a country. You know? Uh, we have to. That's just a new new type of warfare. Yeah. No. Um, lots of information to cover. When is the? Do you have an idea? When is the next uh, type of ju- judgment going to come down or decision in terms of policies? Uh, when the next hearing or ruling is going to come down? Do you know if anything's coming for, out soon or CM- rejected? Yeah. So for 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 CMMC, January the first is when um, revision or one is supposed to come out. Okay. Um, we're, we're on 0.6 right now. 1.0 is supposed to come out in January. Mrs. Arrington is very uh, punctual. She is meeting her deadline. So once that happens and once the accreditation body is established, um, you'll see a lot more momentum. Uh, the accreditation body will, will open up an RFI, I'm sure, for companies who want to be certifiers. They'll give them the standards that they have to meet. Those companies will meet those standards, be sucked into the accreditation body, and then shown how to assess the defense industrial base based on the CMC levels. And then, you know, we'll see, I think a couple pilot programs before September, but then September the 20 of 2020 is when this thing's supposed to, unless something else happens between now and then supposed to officially kick off. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, no, that's, 
that's good. Let's really keep monitoring it. I have in front of me uh, CMC revision point three and point four, and you said we're already at point six. We're at point six. Yeah, you can go. You can. Um, I don't know if it was released publicly or not, but I'm sure if you Google it, um, you should be able to find it. Okay, it's out there for comment right now. Okay. Okay. Um, what do you? What stuff do you advise people to start doing now, if any? Oh, and, and let me let me let me let me qualify that. You, you know, one of the things that I've always said to people, and again, and I, and most of my audience are small businesses, right? They're not, they're not, right? They can't afford twenty five thousand um, dollars. You know, one of the things I said is, again, no one wants to be the leader, right? And spend this money, make a commitment, and then the government decides to change the policy later, which we know right. happens. Right. So that's that is. For, for us, that's our fear, right? Is you go out there, you make the commitment, you invest, and like you and I just discussed, if I invested uh, in CMC 0.3, and now by the time January comes around at 1.0, and then the, the contract language is not going to start talking to September, um, how, how right. much money have I spent already? So, <laughs> go ahead. Right. So this is my advice. So don't worry about CMC. It's not even the law yet. What is the law is that 7012 clause or that 7012 ruling what that there's three requirements to that one you have to have adequate security two you have to report to, to the dib net within um 72 hours of a compromise or an incident three you have to flow that clause down if you're primed all your subcontractors the adequate security requirement is the NIST 800-171 so go ahead download the NIST 800-171 all the 110 security controls and start implementing those. CMMC is going to take those into consideration. They're taking those into their, they're taking those into their uh, level one through five process. And if you implement all of those cybersecurity requirements in the NIST AR-171, you're going to be roughly a level three at CMMC. So it's not money that you're wasting. And it is law right now that you have to implement that, the, the, those security standards. So you might, there might be a little percentage of a change from a left to a right to be officially a level three, but you'll be sitting pretty good if you take those NIST AR-171 controls and, and go ahead and holistically implement those in your IT infrastructure of your company. I like that. Now, you said the 7012 policy. What's that one? Yeah, yeah. Is that so NIST? Is that's that... the, that's, the, that's the DFAR. That's the Defense Federal okay. Acquisition, Acquisition Requirement Supplement. 252.204. Okay, I got you. You're using the last four. All right. Yeah. Yep. I'll just right. use the last four because it's a mouthful to say. No, no, yeah. no, no. I got it. The DFARS clause. Okay. Yep. I'm familiar with that one. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. No, I just we and, it, and again for me, if I'm confused, maybe someone listening might be as well. All right. So the DFARS clause, that's the one where okay, adequate security report uh, any type of uh, breach within a certain right. time frame, and then the flow down right. clause. And, and anyway, here, 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 here's my offer that I give to everybody. If you want to know more, email me, call me, go to our website, type, you know, email info. Dude, we'll, we'll explain all this for free. No charge. All of this for free. We're, we are all about sp spreading knowledge because the more people that know about this, the, the, the more prepared they can, that they can get their company, right? And we'll even, we'll even say, listen, you don't have to use us. There's this company, this, I'll name competitors. Because it doesn't matter to me whether we get your business. I would love to have your business. What matters to me is that your network is secure so that you can continue to do business with the government so that we can protect our fellow warfighters downrange. So whenever our weapons are firing, they actually fire. When we push our, our, our buttons to make missiles go, go off, they don't just fall out of the sky. That shit's important. So I'm not – if you want information, feel free. Hit me up. I'll – gladly give you information i'll even give you competitors names where you can go and say well you know h2o you're a little too little too pricey i'm going to go with joe over here but here's what i won't give you i will not give you a shitty cybersecurity company that won't do you right i'll make sure we vet even our competitors i will give you good cybersecurity companies that i know that if you use you'll be doing just as well if you used us well why don't you leave your email that they can send an email to while you're at it Sure. Yeah. So it's Jonathan J O N A T H A N dot hard H A R D at H two L solutions dot com. That's H as in hotel. The number two L as in Lima solutions with an S dot com. 
And they can always send it to info at h2l.com as well, right? Yeah, yeah. they can go to our website, www.h2lsolutions.com. And the website or the email on there is info at h2lsolutions.com. And Both we, of those go straight to me. And we will have links to all this in the show notes page um, on all of the oh, channels perfect. and all the communications. Yes. And then any other information that you'd like to share as well, we will make sure we provide that uh, links to that in the show notes as well on our site over at govaconjiants.com forward slash podcast. Well, Jonathan, um, man, you've given us a mouthful today, a lot to chew on, but I'm happy, you know, that we had this conversation. I've had so many people ask me about this. And as you can imagine, no, all the information is different. Uh, people are saying different things. And I wanted to get someone on here who had the experience, who had the wherewithal and the knowledge to share with our audience today. So thank you for that. Also, if we can, uh, let's circle back around. Um, if you have any updates or anything else that you'd like to share that comes out next year, let's circle back around and have another conversation because I definitely want to keep. Oh, I'd love to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, Please, and, I'd love to be a regular. Yeah, and also what I'd like to do, if possible, we do a video. So we can do it because I, I have a, uh, a large following on YouTube. And so we, you know, if we did a video, that way we can also show like documents and things like that as well. That'd be great. Oh, perfect. Yeah. As long as we can focus on my right side, that's my best side. That's what so we're going to do. We're going to gonna focus on your right yeah, side. Right? <laughs> okay, perfect. All right. Perfect. perfect. Hey, yeah. All right. Jonathan, listen, thank, hey, thank you so much for coming on today. And we'll definitely keep in contact. And if you have any information else that you want to connect with everybody out there, uh, we'll make sure you send us an email. We'll provide it to the audience. All right. Thank you so okay. much. I really appreciate it. No, Jonathan, thank you. Have a great day. Okay, you too. Bye-bye. All right. Bye now. We want to thank Jonathan for coming on today and helping explain the topic a little bit better and also provide us some basic guidelines that we can follow to start working towards implementing our own plan. Even though the DOD has been discussing the topic of how to secure our systems for several years now, many people suspect and believe that now we are approaching the point of no return. Much like beta.sam.gov was finally released and FBO memorialized, CMMC is coming faster than we think. I just want to share my thoughts with everyone out there. By the way, if you're not aware, we will be visiting an upcoming city near you this year. Check out our Instagram page at GovCon Giants for more information as to the dates, times, and location. And as always, the show notes from this episode, book recommendations, and more will be posted on our website at govcongiants.com forward slash podcast. 